Welcome to Pioneer Parent Academy. Today we're bringing to you a session called Social Emotional Development. We have some amazing guests with us this morning that serve as counselors, etc., on our different campuses. Today our guests are Ms. Regina Forehand, elementary counselor, Sharonda McGahey, elementary counselor, Darlene Sowers, junior high counselor, Lee Keller, high school counselor, and Sandy Daniels, school psychology specialist and school-based mental health coordinator. Our first mm -hmm. guest bringing to you information about social emotional development in the elementary setting is Miss Regina Forehand. Yes, at the elementary level, all the elementary schools in the Batesville School District use the Choose Love Social Emotional Learning Program. And the idea of Choose Love is that there are four components that help us choose love each day. Courage, gratitude, forgiveness, and compassion in action. And we have some motions that we learn to go with those words to help us remember to choose love. And I have Amory here, a third grade student. Uh, Amory, are you ready to show them how we remember the choose love formula? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's do it. So we have courage, courage gratitude, gratitude, forgiveness, forgiveness compassion and action and that is the choose love formula on the next slide you can see a little bit more about choose love it's basically a program that's developed to help us understand our emotions and have good relationships with others it was inspired by a six-year-old named jesse lewis who was killed in the sandy hook shootings his mother scarlett had a big choice to make when her heart was devastated with the loss of her son. And she decided to choose love and start this program to help students all across our nation um, learn more about social emotional well being. Her idea is that children who feel connected and who reciprocate love will not want to harm each other. She feels like love is a universal need and the lack of that love can be devastating. The goal of the Choose Love program is to provide children with the knowledge and the attitude and the skills to choose love in any situation. The skills that we learn here, children and adults, give us a foundation for our personal fulfillment and happiness and getting along with one another. The next slide goes into a little bit of each of the four components. And we have lessons throughout the year that help us with this. So one of my favorite lessons is under courage. And when we talk about courage, we talk about learning to recognize our anxiety, um, how we're feeling, if we're nervous or shy or overwhelmed, to stop and acknowledge our feelings and to take a brave breath. Just take a moment to acknowledge how we're feeling, pause, and then make a, the right choice to choose love, even in a difficult circumstance. And one technique for doing that is called a brave breath. So to take a brave breath, you just can feel your chest and breathe in deeply. Hold it for a minute and then breathe out. Just taking a moment to recognize how you're feeling, acknowledge your emotions, to be still and mindful. Take your brave breath and then choose love. So that's just an example of one of the skills that we teach under each of the four tenets of choose love. Again, those are courage, gratitude, forgiveness, and compassion in action. Our next guest is Ms. Sharonda McGahey to tell us more about choose love. Thank you. So we implement the Choose Love program at our elementary campuses through routine scheduled guidance lessons. And this is our tier one intervention at the elementary levels. And we wanted to share with you some of these activities we do. In the first photo, you'll see one of our third graders holding up her Choose Love journal. They get the opportunity to design and personalize that. The journal is used throughout the school year uh, during our guidance lessons. And then the students take those home at the end of the year 
to continue to reference and be able to remember what we've discussed and to use those skills they've learned. The middle picture is one of our first grade students after having the Brave Breath lesson where his worksheet, he traced the words and then drew a great picture of what he looks like when he takes a Brave Breath. And the last picture is a good example of our student leaders that help us, our older students help us with special projects. This project was a few years ago when we entered into a contest with the Choose Love program. And the students worked hard on that poster and then we hung it up in the school to be displayed. Another way student leaders help us is in the mornings with our daily announcements. They will share the daily dose of love and this is a great way to begin our school day with a loving thought. And on the next slide, we always encourage students after a guidance lesson to take this information home, share it with their families, help their families learn to have courage to make the right choices, to have gratitude for the things that we have, to forgive others and to have compassion for others. And if parents would like to implement this more at home, if they go to the website, the chooselovemovement.org, there's a section on, on the home and they can help parents and family to implement this more at home if they would like. Thank you so much, Ms. Sharonda. Up next, we have Ms. Darlene Sowers, our junior high counselor, to tell us information about middle school social emotional development and learning. Take it away, Ms. Sowers. Good morning. Um, just building off of what our elementary counselor shared, uh, coming to the junior high is a huge step for our sixth graders. A lot of time of transitions. I'm sure parents are probably more aware, just as aware as we are about what a, a big change it is. And just some of the characteristics are on the screen there. They seek to develop their own identity. They try to find a where they fit in. A lot of times we see how friend groups change at this level, and that's something that's really difficult for them. They've had this group of friends they've always had, and then they get to the junior high and that starts to shift and change. And so that could be a difficult transition. And of course, they start to exert their independence from their parents. They're starting to pull away a little bit, and they place great importance on friends and groups, peer approval, and they tend to shift trust from adults to peers and go to peers' advice, and we often see this. Uh, students start looking to their own age group for um, all kinds of situations. They really put a lot of emphasis on how they appear in the eyes of their friends. And then they struggle with the spotlight effect, the idea that the social situation, all eyes are on them. They can be very self-conscious all the time, fear of embarrassment, of messing up, of being uh, ridiculed for something they do and so they hold back a lot of times and won't step out because they don't want to get put in the spotlight and they develop the personal fable they believe their feelings and thoughts are unique that no one else is like them um, and that's kind of interesting when we do get to talk to classes they really start to find out hey I'm not the only one and so that's good and they frequently feel social discomfort awkwardness loneliness of course angry sad and anxious they just have a lot of emotions all at work and then when to be concerned. Uh, of course, there's a lot of factors, but some things you might see is sleeping disorders or excessively sleeping or insomnia. Now we often hear, talk to students, they'll say, well, I, I didn't sleep last night or I didn't go to bed last night. Well, why didn't you? And they have various reasons. And I'll have to say a lot of times it's because they're on a device. Uh, but lack of sleep can affect them greatly emotionally and mentally. And then unexplained excessive fatigue, indicator of depression or substance abuse, they start to change. Uh, low self-esteem at this stage, they really compare themselves to other people a lot and don't see their value and uniqueness and talents because they're measuring themselves by others. A loss of interest in favorite pastimes, that can happen. A decline in academic performance, which is a big indicator. If we start seeing a student whose grades are starting to fall or maybe a lack of attendance, we start to get concerned and that's a big red flag. Uh, weight loss, loss of appetite. Uh, again, at this age, um, they body image, they start comparing themselves and they may develop some bad habits or unhealthy habits uh, as far as trying to control their weight. And then personality shifts, aggressiveness or excessive anger, 
and maybe even um, moving on to self-harm or a tendency to isolate. I would say this since COVID, we've seen more that students, uh, because of you know mandated isolation, they had to be isolated, that it was difficult for them to come back and join a social crowd at school. And so that's something we've seen a little bit more as students uh, have tended to want to isolate more. And then here at the middle school, uh, we as counselors, Mr. Crow and I, we do see, teach uh, lead a sixth grade life skills class, which has been very beneficial uh, for us, especially because we uh, now get to in, meet all sixth graders at some point in the year. And that's helped us to develop friendships or relationships or get to know the students in ways we haven't in the past. And so that's been very, very helpful. And for us, some of the things that we uh, use to develop our lessons, um, we've adapted them for our time slots that we have is the ArcSAR Department uh, Guide for Life. And you'll see those on the right. And they, that's an acronym for growth and understanding, interaction, decisions, and empathy. And in our lessons, we always, I always start off with respect, which is huge. If we could develop that in our students and everything else will kind of take care of itself. But um, some of the things that come under that is empathy and then self image, knowing their strengths and their weaknesses. And then having the growth mindset, this uh, goes with what elementary again was building on that overcoming obstacles, perseverance, perseverance, resilience, decision-making skills, and then effective communication as far as voice, tone, body language, and active listening. And I would also put in there Naviance is an excellent resource too that parents have access to as well as students because it has some really good uh, videos in there about all of these things, like over 8,000 videos that students can access that touches on the themes of discouragement and doubt and failures and, and also it's so many others. I would strongly recommend that parents get on line with their students and check out Naviance and the videos on Road Trip Nation. Those are wonderful. And then here is resources. Um, we have counselors, again, like I said, two, and just open door responsive services. Students are welcome to come into us anytime. Teachers will often contact us if they have concerns about a student. And then we also have uh, a behavioral interventionist, Ms. Poe Wilkins. Her door is always there too. And of course she is, um, her role is just that, that's to be aware of our students, what they're going through, making contact with the students. And if students uh, need it, to set up uh, routine touch point times with them just to see how they're doing. And then as well, the school-based mental health services that we provide to families who, who want to inquire about that. And then uh, social emotional development, I mean, there's excessive amount of information. If you want to just go out there and look at it, there's all kinds of resources. But something I found that I thought was very beneficial was God for, on the Guide for Life website, Arkansas Department of Education's website, uh, Dr. Michelle Borba. And this is a podcast to listen to that just really lays it out as to what students need at this time uh, and the areas they need to grow in. And there's the podcast link if you wish to look, listen to it. I hope you do. But uh, keep communication open with your student and honest. That's key. Uh, oftentimes we talk to students and they want to talk to their parents, but they're scared. Um, they uh, often use the word, my parents will be so disappointed in me. Um, or they're fearful of uh, punishment or um, what... Uh, also losing a device. Um, they might be in a situation where they're unsafe or it's unhealthy, and yet they can't see that, uh, that they need to be open about that and get help because they'll say, well, they'll take my device away from me. They don't have the executive function to realize that when you're weighing your uh, safety and your welfare against having your device taken away for a time, that's really no comparison, but they have a hard time seeing that. So keep that communication open so that your student will feel comfortable coming to talk to you and not be afraid to talk to you. Um, and then be willing to share your own adolescence for them to be able to relate that you've, you've had failures too and you've gone through situations that you can relate to them. And then limit screen time. Students are uh, need more time just to rest their minds and, 
and hearts and just have a place we'll get away from it. And then I shared on there from Dr. Borba's Thrivers. It's a book she's written. She's written over 25 books on things such as she's a former educator, mom, and then encourage confidence. A child understands their strengths and their weaknesses. And when we say confidence, it's that not that they have to have this ego type confidence, but they have the confident confidence that they are capable, that they're able uh, to meet challenges and achieve. And then teach empathy. Um, something that Dr. Borba said within the last 30 years that our capacity for empathy has dropped 40%. Uh, and that was very critical to students' social emotional well being. And then self control learn to not uh, need immediate gratification, integrity, knows personal values and boundaries. That's something uh, we see often with students is that they want to do the right thing, uh, but they need the courage to know what their own values are and be able to hold ground uh, with where they stand. And then encourage curiosity, problem solving, critical thinking and perseverance. Uh, one thing that's brought out about that is that to keep on keeping on, and that's where our grit uh, lessons come in very helpful, that students should know that they're gonna run into obstacles, even failures, but to keep on keeping on. And one thing that come out um, in, is that students understand, um, and Dr. Borber brought this out, was that the, everybody gets a trophy concept, really isn't effective, and students, when you talk to them in sixth grade, man, they really jump on that. They know that that's, uh, not beneficial to them and they see through it. And so that's something to uh, be mindful of too. And then just being optimistic and hopeful uh, that this is a temporary time uh, in life and that there's hope for the future and to be optimistic. Thank you so much, Ms. Sowers, for that information. It's so important for us to have an understanding of the concepts that you shared with us today. Up next, we have Ms. Lee Keller, one of our high school counselors, to share information about high school social emotional development and learning. Take it away, Ms. Keller. Good morning. Um, mine is going to sound a whole lot like what the middle school kids, what's important to them, because middle school is such a pivotal part of uh, children's emotional development and that they're starting to not be that cute little kid anymore. I live with a middle schooler um, and they're starting to turn into a teenager. And so high school is an interesting time and in that I have a lot of parents tell me like, I do not know how you're with teenagers every day because they like, they're like, they're, they're so hard to talk to. And while they are hard to talk to, they're still, they're very similar to elementary kids. They're just bigger with car keys and phones. So uh, characteristics of social emotional development in high school kids are they are becoming their own person. They begin to not think in such concrete terms, like not in black and white, and they can start to see the gray. Like I have some kids and um, I say that they're more social justice warriors because they're always ready to fight the good fight for what's right, whether it's they don't want to wear their mask or they don't want to do that. They want to fight dress code. And so that their brains are changing. And so that is why they argue with you so much, parents. There's there's hope that eventually they'll stop arguing with you so much, but that's why their identity is so important to them. And they are so ready to get behind some, whatever's right. If it means they get a longer lunch on Fridays or whatever, the, whatever the latest thing is, they're going to fight for it. Uh, relationships with peers become so much more important than relationships with their parents and guardians. That is a hard, a hard shift because parents sometimes, as Ms. Sowers mentioned, you know, it turns into during middle school years, they are not willing to spend all their time with their parents and follow only their parents for advice. And so they're starting to shift and it's a healthy shift. We want them to become their own person, but it's also kind of painful for parents because relationships with those peers, is, it just becomes so much more important to them than the relationships they have with the parents in their lives. Uh, teenagers measure their self-worth by who their peer group is and their interaction with others. And so, you know, it's so painful when we have kids that come in and as a counselor, I know Ms. Wallace and I try a lot to say, okay, what is your thing? What is your thing going to be? Is it going to be that you're a robotics kid or you're a sports kid or a band kid? Because that is going to be who they spend most of their time with. And so I always say everybody needs a thing. They need a thing. If if your thing is going to be that you take all the AP classes and you run cross country and you're on the swim team, that's fantastic because your self-worth is going to be measured by all of those people you spend all that time with. And so we always want kids to feel like they belong somewhere. And we have so many places here for them to belong. If they're that chess kid or esports, you know, get them involved in that. Get them involved in a peer group. If you see your kid floundering, 
you know, just contact us and we can help you find a thing for them to do because we have so many places where they could fit here at the high school. Um, some examples of when you should be concerned as a parent of a high school kid. Um, they are, you know, as, as we know, teenagers, they like to go with, I live with a preteen, not a teenager yet, thank goodness. But he likes to go to his room and that's his space already. And so the difference is now like he leaves the door open and I go in there with him a lot, which kind of gets on his nerves sometimes. But if your child is in there all the time and they never come out and you don't see them, they're not on the phone you know, they're not talking to friends online, they're not talking to anybody, that would be a good time for you to maybe say, hey, I think we need some help because they're isolating from friends, they're isolating from family and trusted adults. If you start to see changes in their appearance, like their hygiene um, or weight loss. Now remember teenagers, their appearance is super important to them. So if you start seeing that they have changed, they're not bathing, they're not wearing deodorant, they're not brushing their teeth, they've lost weight, they've gained weight, then that's kind of a, a factor you see, like maybe we're dealing with some depression, some anxiety, because you know, if you're 14 to 18 years old, it's very, very important to how you're seen by other people. And so that's always a sign for us that maybe something has changed at home or something has changed um, maybe in their patterns. If they might be trying some drugs, they might be doing things that are not so healthy for them changes in their sleep patterns. Teenagers come in, they have like two speeds, either they don't sleep at all or they sleep too much. And so if you see that they're not sleeping at all and they come in here and they, a lot of them work and they don't sleep, they don't sleep at night because they're on that phone when they get home. Um, but if you see that they're sleeping all day long and they're not getting up to get on that phone, that would be also a good sign that maybe we need to get some help. Sudden change in a friend group. That is always just a, a big red flag for parents because if it's friends that you've heard them talking about all the time and then all of a sudden they don't and they start talking about new people, uh, that is a, that's a red flag for parents. Also, extreme change in their personality. So if you have known your child, you know, their personality, who they are at like 10 or 11 is pretty much probably who they're going to be. That's their, their personality. And so if you start seeing a change in their personality, they become super aggressive or they go from being really aggressive to being really calm, all of a sudden, that would be a sign that we maybe need to reach out to somebody to get some help. So our next slide, some of the examples of the ways, the levels that we have, we have a, a few tiers at the high school of levels for development, how you can get that help for your teenager. So you say you see some of those things happening, their grades are tanking, they're not sleeping, you're seeing all the changes in their appearance. What can you do? Uh, at the junior high and the high school, we have a class called Second Block. And so the kids have that same teacher for four years every day, A day or B day. And so that person has those 15 to 20 kids every day for four years. And so they're gonna know things about them that maybe as a school counselor, I don't know because I'm assigned to about 500 and that teacher is assigned to 20 kids all year long, every year. And so that would be a person for you to reach out for first. Uh, I, have, I get a lot of contacts from our second block teachers saying, hey, I need you to check on this kid. Like something has really changed at home. Their grades are totally like totally different than they used to be. Their grades don't matter to them anymore. So that would be tier one would be our second block mentor teacher or classroom teacher. Uh, teachers spend more time with kids than we do. And actually as a parent, my, my child's teachers spend more time with him than I get to spend with him. So that would be the first level. Second level is school counselor. And then many times we're called upon to be the person that refers students for school-based mental health. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. What is school-based mental health? How do we access that for our students? What does it look like and how do we get there? Okay, so how can you how can you support your child? You know, we have a lot of people say like teenagers are just hard. They're hard um, because they're becoming adults and they're becoming who we want them to be. But it's a hard it's a hard change. So some things that you can do to support your child through these high school years is to be a positive role model for them. And that's just like you know, be who you want them to be. I say that to parents a lot. So you can't live your life one way and then expect them to live another because you're their first role model. So they see you probably more than they see anybody else. So that's number one is be, be that positive role model. Number two, listen without judgment. And that's hard to do as a parent to just listen. And so, because I found that if you listen to the little things like about their day, then they'll talk to you about the big things. And so it's kind of that way as school counselors too, that if you just listen to them talk about their grades, about maybe wanting a schedule change, then it always opens up into something else and something deeper than what they're really feeling about their grades. 
get to know their friends. Find out who your child is talking to. Who do they eat lunch with? Uh, my own child, that is my way to figure out kind of how his day went, is who do you eat lunch with today? And, you know, to him, it sounds like a really normal question. Like, why does my mom care so much about lunch? But like, it tells me a lot about like, okay, who are you sitting with? Because that's who he chooses to spend time with, not who he's in class with. But like, who are you spending time with during lunch and that time, that recess that sixth graders get to have outside? So get to know who your kids eat lunch with. Like, who do you spend that time with? Who are you spending after school with? Talk about your feelings and your life experiences, even like the uncomfortable parts, like your failures. Nobody likes to talk about where they failed in life um, as a human, but my gosh, it helps so much to talk about that with your kids. I talk about that with students in my office because they'll come in and say, oh my gosh, Miss Keller, math is so hard. What do I need to do about that? I'm like, I, you know, we're going to get through this together because math was always really hard for me. You know, I'm on the other side of it. I'll never take another math class ever again for the rest of my life. Praise God. But, um, but that is always great. It's always helpful for kids to hear about like, okay, you failed too and you were still successful. So that's super important as parents for them to know that. And that last one is focus on the positive. It's so easy to get dragged down in all the negative things that are going on in the world right now, but you can help your child see the positive and you can help them see that in everyday situations like you know, I, we can't afford to do vacation next summer, but hey, we're going to go this weekend. We're going to do some special stuff. We're going to go, you know, eat dinner somewhere special. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. So uh, focus on the positive with them, the positives in their life and train their, help them train their brains on how to see those positive things. Okay, so here's an example of that social emotional tiers of support that we have at Batesville Schools. That first one is classroom instruction, modeling discussions, social media outreach. And so that would be your classroom teachers, uh, those second block teachers that I mentioned. Uh, tier two is school counselor lessons, individual or group interventions. And so we also at the high school have open door policy in that if my door is open, you come in. You come in, I, if I don't have time, I will make time for you. If you'll just sit for just a second and give me a second, then I will always make sure that I have time for you. Uh, tier three is school-based mental health. And so we're going to talk about how to get that referral and how to do that. I know Miss Miss Daniels mentioned that also for school-based mental health services. A lot of times our students will have that relationship with a therapist. And so then the school counselor and the therapist can communicate about how we can best serve that student. You know, how can I back up what they're doing in therapy in my office as a counselor? And how can I pass that information along to classroom teachers on how they can help too? School-based mental health is, um, and we always refer to it as just SVMH, that acronym, is the provision of therapeutic interventions for students within the school setting. And so there's lots of kids here who get therapy and they maybe don't do that at school. And so sometimes that's just a really easy way for a kid, if they have transportation issues, for us to get them to see a therapist at school. We understand that sometimes they they may not want to do that. They may, may not feel comfortable talking to a therapist in the middle of the day and then going to PE and then going to Algebra 2. Uh, but we definitely offer that. And it's it's been a very positive thing for our students because then the therapist can talk to us about how, how can we help that student? How can we help them do better in their classes at Batesville High School? Those services support the mission and the purpose of our schools in that they can kind of get information from us and back us up during that therapeutic treatment with those students. Thank you, Ms. Keller. That information is so powerful. And our final guest today is Ms. Sandy Daniels. Take it away, Sandy. Good morning. Um, I'm here to talk about the Batesville School District School-Based Mental Health Program. And um, basically, uh, a school-based mental health program is available for all of our students in grades uh, uh, preschool through 12th grade. Uh, students are identified uh, through the parents, teachers, counselors, and other people um, in our district that may be concerned about uh, students' um, behavior, their socialization, their uh, ability to cope with stress, anxiety. They may be seeing um, sadness, other types of things. So basically what happens is our school counselors are our gatekeepers for this program. And once that they uh, receive a referral, uh, they can do it themselves or a teacher may come and talk with them, a parent may come and talk with them. Um, a referral is made to um, our mental health program. We then process that referral through our school-based mental health office 
and send that to one of our partnering agencies. Um, there is no out-of-pocket expense to parents, but we uh, do ask for any pace horse available so that we can sustain our program. Um, generally, our services are provided through the school day at a school location, usually on campus, and we have identified specific uh, spaces in our buildings for school-based mental health services to happen. We try to maintain as much confidentiality as uh, school space allows so that kids feel safe talking about those types of deep subjects that they may need to, to share process with the school counselors and with our uh, mental health therapists um, or alternative spaces if needed. A lot of times um, we do have students who actually go to clinic to the clinic or um, maybe the counselor comes into the home, especially during the summertime, so our services are year-round. Um, just wherever that uh, really the parents, the student, and the therapist, excuse me, the therapist feels that um, the services would uh, be best. Our partnering agencies are currently uh, The Point Behavioral Health and Methodist Family Health. Uh, generally, we have one or two des uh, designated therapists that provide mental health services at each campus. The agency is responsible for any billing um, and assigning the therapists, um, though we do have some interaction with the agency about um, who comes into our school and make sure that they have passed all the background checks and all of the safety precautions are are made through our contract our and our business associates agreement allows us to share information back and forth for continuity of care. So once the agency receives the referral and the therapist gets that referral, they will schedule an intake, um, something we call an intake. Um, basically, it's a meeting with the student and the the parent or guardian and the therapist just to talk about the referral concerns. And then once that intake is completed, the therapist will schedule to see the child at school, though again, it could be at home or it could be um, in the clinic, just whatever works best. And um, most of the time, it the services do happen at school during non-instructional time. So a lot of times what happens is um, especially at the secondary level, they'll try to pull students during um, maybe alternate between PE and art or um, some elective that they have, um, second block, those types of times. And then at the elementary, they just really work with the teachers to determine what time is best so that the student misses as least, as little instructional time as possible. Basically, that's it. Mental health matters. Don't be afraid to talk about it. We have uh, a campaign um, in May where we really talk about May is Mental Health Awareness Month. We want to break the stigma. Um, we want folks to reach out who need those types of services and let us help in any way we can. This concludes our Pioneer Parent Academy session called Social Emotional Development. Today, you've got to hear about the progression of social emotional development and learning from elementary to middle school to high school um, and about school-based mental health services. If you would like to request more information about any of the things that you've heard today, please reach out to your school counselors or you may complete the Google form that will be attached in the link below. Thank you so much.